Let's sing together, All I Have is Christ. After the song, if uh, any kids want to go out to Sunday school, we'll, we'll pray for you before you go. Let's sing together. was lost in darkest night. 
Father, thank you for the truth that is in that. Lord, you are our life. You're all that really matters in the end. When we think of eternity and, and this life, Lord, there's nothing better than knowing that, our, that we are secure in you. God, we pray for our wee children in this church. As they go now uh, to Sunday school, we'll be with Stacy God, and uh, thank you for our service there. We pray for their hearts, Lord, the, all the kids in this church, Lord, that they'll understand the true Saviour who is Jesus Christ. We pray for Jeff also as he speaks to us, Lord, help us to open our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, please turn back with me to Genesis 43 and have that chapter open in front of you. Don't be embarrassed about going and grabbing a Bible. If you go on your knees, then you'll just look like one of the other kids going out and you can grab one and get back to your seat and nobody will even notice. Um, go and grab one though and it'll be, it'll be so helpful to have that in front of you. Good boy, Caleb. I was just about to ask somebody to close that door and you were on the case. Um, so we meet again this evening, 6.30, and I'd say we continue our series in Ruth, but we only got one introduction in last time, so we're going to restart our series in Ruth. So it's a great time to start coming in the evenings. It's a great book for us to go through, a bit like Joseph's life. Um, lots of drama, but lots of practical, helpful application for us to take away from that book. I know it's quite tricky um, jumping back into a series that we, we kind of split by a week, and it's all been by videos so far, but I hope it won't be. Um, too much of a stretch to, to catch up on where we are. I'll give you a recap in a moment. But first of all, I want to just tie up some loose threads from the videos. Because if you remember, if you're a really keen watcher of the videos, you remember that I said at the start of the last one that we would talk about the problems with Joseph's character at the end of that talk, and then I never did. Um, now, nobody's come and grabbed me by the collar and said, look, Jeff, you forgot to do that, but, but we're going to do it now. So the first thing I want us to think about is Joseph's character, because last time, if you remember, we followed his brothers down the road of repentance, and we saw how Joseph confronted his brothers in a way that caused them to think deeply about their past sins, and he was trying to do them good, but he did it in a way that was not good. He lied. And he twisted the truth. And so before we go any further, we want to deal with this prickly problem of Joseph's deception. Now the reason it's prickly is because we've been holding up Joseph as a great example for us to imitate. Especially because of his incredible faithfulness, his dedication and commitment to following God and his word. And so it's only natural that when things go wrong, we want to either brush them under the carpet or, or cover over them, gloss over them, so that we can preserve Joseph's reputation. And, and so we try and find excuses then for his lying. But if we were meant to do that, it would have been very easy for the Bible to leave out those details. It would have been very easy for the Bible to leave out those little bits that cause us to question Joseph's character. See, the only person that the Bible insists is perfect is the Lord Jesus, not Joseph. And the fact that the Bible is real about Joseph, the fact that the Bible doesn't hide the flaws of its heroes, gives us all the more reason to trust that this book is true. And then when it comes to the Lord Jesus, we can trust it's being real too. So Joseph's brothers have left Egypt and on the way home, verse 28 of the previous chapter, one of the brothers finds his money is in his sack. When they get home, they find that all of their money has been returned. They explain to their dad, Simeon is being kept as a prisoner in Egypt until they return with Benjamin. Jacob refuses to let Benjamin go back with the brothers, and so Reuben tries convincing him. Verse 37, he makes lots of silly promises. Jacob refuses, flat refuses to let Benjamin go. And so the family uh, have got food, but very heavy, sad hearts. Now in chapter 43, verse 1, we read the famine was severe in the land. And so the family that had food and sad hearts run out of food. And all they've got left is their heavy hearts, because the famine was just as severe as God had promised it would be. Do you know that God's painful promises are as guaranteed as his pleasant ones? You know, no Christians have trouble believing in heaven, but a lot struggle with the idea of hell. 
all God's promises are true. And so Jacob's only hope then is another trip to Egypt to send the brothers to get more food. And it's at this point there's an incredibly revealing and important conversation between Jacob, whose other name is Israel, and so it's intermittent through the chapter. There's this important conversation between Jacob and his son Judah in verse 2 through to 14. That's where I'm looking now. I want you to view this like a play where we've got a speaker and then what they say and then the next speaker and what they say. So the first speaker is in verse 2. And Jacob says to his boys, you've got to go back. Otherwise, we're going to starve. And then verse 3 to 5, Judah replies, we will go back. But not without Benjamin. We won't be allowed back unless Benjamin is with us. Well, Jacob's flustered. Why did you even tell the governor of Egypt that you've got another brother? Verse 7, Judah and the boys remain calm. And they reply honestly and gently with respect. We were questioned, Dad. And so we told the truth. We answered honestly. Then verse 8 to 9, Judah speaks again. And he's gentle. And he's persuasive. And he shows his father sincere respect. He says, look, I'll bear the responsibility on this one. I'll take it on myself. You can hold me accountable. I will make it my personal mission, my duty to bring Benjamin back to you. And so he's completely respectful. And then verse 10, he's quite firm. Dad, we could have been there back, been there and back twice by now. If you just let us go. Now, I told you that this is an important and revealing conversation, and you're probably looking at that and thinking, really? Because it seems very normal, very everyday. It doesn't have any of the drama and the action that we've seen through Joseph's life. Why is this so important? Let me give you some answers. Number one, this is a beautiful example of how to speak to your parents. Some believe that the reason the Titanic struck the iceberg was because of the stubbornness of the captain refused to take the, the advice of his junior officers. And you know that the relationship between juniors and seniors is always a tricky one, especially when those in authority are convinced that they know best. Now, there's no more tricky relationship than the one between parents and their kids because our parents have seen us behave stupidly. They've watched us make mistakes. They've often had to pull us out of trouble. And so our relationship with our parents is always one of teacher and student. But then as we become adults, that relationship changes. And it can be very difficult to know how to relate to mum and dad and how to speak to them, especially when they're in the wrong. So how do we challenge mum and dad while honoring God who calls us to honor them. Well, this is a great example. See, first, Judah is patient. When those boys first came back from Egypt and they arrived back and, and Jacob notices that Simeon's missing and they tell him that Benjamin's got to come back with us, he, he's immediately flustered. And he has a bit of a breakdown. And verse 36, Reuben speaks to him and tries to fix the problem straight away. He talks to dad immediately and his advice is totally foolish. He said, look, Dad, if I don't bring back Benjamin, you can kill my kids. What kind of advice is that? If your son dies, don't worry, you can kill your grandkids. Who's going to take that kind of advice? What kind of offer is that? It's the wrong advice, and it's at the wrong time. Jacob was in no position in that moment to hear anything when that news is broken. And so Judah, he waits. And there's this cooling off period. And so we're seeing it's sensible for us not only to pick our battles, but to choose the timing of them very wisely. Then Judah is respectful, and he's humble, and he listens to what his dad says, and he replies carefully and gently, but he's also firm. And so he makes his point clearly while giving Jacob the recognition he deserves as head of the family. And as he does that, Jacob's heart melts. And he agrees. Because you don't win your parents by breaking the fifth commandment. The wrath, the hastiness, the impatience of man does not bring about the righteousness of God. And if you've got trouble relating to your parents, as many do, respect, gentleness, firmness with self-control, these are the fertilizers 
for a healthy relationship with them, healthy communication with them. Another reason this conversation is so important, and I'm stressing that, is that it reveals the present working of God. See, God has been at work in these brothers. And he's brought conviction of sin, which led to confession. Remember, we saw this in the previous chapter, and the beginning of the work of repentance. But it's not only in the brothers that God is working. God is going to do something about Jacob's favoritism, which is still alive and well. Jacob is still playing favorites with Benjamin, and we know that because his favoritism goes as far as allowing his family to go hungry longer than they needed to, and allowing Simeon to stay in prison longer than was ever necessary, all because he refuses to let go of his boy Benjamin. He won't let him go on a trip down to Egypt. But as he does in every believer's heart, God is at work in Jacob. Jacob had put Benjamin in a place that he never should have been. He loved Benjamin above everyone and everything else. But the only person that, God sh- that, that Jacob should love above everyone else is, of course, God. That's God's place that Benjamin has taken. And now God is going to take Benjamin away too. Just like he took Joseph away earlier after Jacob had promoted him to that top spot. God is going to take Benjamin away too because Jacob needs to learn that God does not share his spot with anyone else. And that seems cruel that Jacob should have to go through the pain of seeing his son walk off across the horizon, maybe never to come back. But it's actually kind because only when God is king in our lives, only when he occupies the top spot, can we be truly happy. And the same goes for all of us. God will not tolerate any other lords in the lives of his people other than Jesus. God is determined that Jesus should be the one that we love most. And he is so committed to that goal, he will strip us of anything we put in his place. Whether it's family, whether it's our kids, whether it's our our friends, hobbies, work, farm. If you love those things more than Jesus, don't expect to get into heaven. Because the only king with power to keep your soul eternally is King Jesus. Jacob hasn't changed yet. But the third reason this conversation is so important is because it shows us that Judah has. Remember what Judah was like in chapter 38? Do you remember that chapter that I didn't really want to preach to you about because it was so awful? This was a man who did everything he could to dodge responsibility. This is a man who would swap his authority for as little as a night with a prostitute. But the Judah of chapter 38 is not the Judah of chapter 43. Something has changed. And now he says, I will take responsibility on myself. He's volunteering to have the life of another in his hands. And so we're beginning to see the fruit of God's work in these brothers. A transformation is taking place, and this conversation highlights that. See, Judah has successfully won over his dad, and Jacob agrees. He tells the boys if they're going, then they should take gifts with them for the governor, verse 11 through to 13. And Jacob's used this tactic before, if you know a bit more about Jacob's life. It really echoes of how he uh, was very nervous about a reunion with his brother Esau and sent all these gifts ahead of himself to kind of butter up Esau and make him favorable towards him. And so now um, Jacob's doing that to Joseph, even though he doesn't realize it's Joseph. And we're beginning then to see the fulfillment of that second dream as, as Jacob humbles himself before Joseph. And then in verse 14, we see the other side of Jacob's character. And this is incredible because for all of his faults, Jacob is a godly man. And, and you think Sam and Hamish, they named their little boy Jacob, and they might have been reading through all this thing. Oh, is that a mistake? Should we have done that? And, and now we see something in Jacob that seems so long hidden, but it's so wonderful and rich, and his godliness breaks through the, his weakness and his failure like, like sun through dark clouds. And he sends the brothers out. And we might think as we read that, 
that verse, where am I? 43, um, verse 14. We might think those last words, if I am bereaved of my children, I am bereaved. We might think, oh, he's just being fatalistic. But the context of those words, the bit that precedes it, shows us that that's not the case at all. We see his godliness break out. He's not abandoning his boys to fate, but he is resigned totally to the will of God. Now, now it, it can be really hard, and, and I know I've spoken to a number of you about this before. It can be really hard for us to know how to pray when God already knows everything that we need. But Jacob gives us a, a beautiful lesson here in prayer. And just as Judah showed us how to speak to our earthly fathers, well, now Jacob's going to show us how to speak to our heavenly father. First, he confesses everything he wants. May God Almighty grant you mercy before the man and may he send back your brother and Benjamin. He wants mercy and he wants his boys to come home. Those are the desires of his heart and he lays them out before God, but he leaves the answer to God. Leaves it there. If I'm bereaved, I'm bereaved. I'll leave it in the hands of, and the name he uses for God here is really important, God Almighty, El Shaddai. I'll leave it with the God who's in control of everything, from the movement of planets to the movement of molecules. All things in his hand, I'll leave it to the God of power, God Almighty. And so Jacob isn't coy about what he wants. He doesn't do what we sometimes do in corporate prayer, where we mask our desires behind theological catchphrases and, and words that, are, that sound clever and make us perhaps look good. But he tells God exactly and plainly what he's longing for. But then he will take whatever God gives. He gladly requests his desires and gratefully receives God's design. It's like saying, I want this. But what if what I want is not what you want, then I don't want it. I'll have whatever you give because I know that your will for me is greater and better and sweeter than my own. Now that pattern is, uh, you, your minds have gone there. It's parallel beautifully in the perfect prayer of the Lord Jesus. And you think about him praying in Gethsemane as he lays out his desires before his God. If there's another way other than the cross, let's take it. But if not, your will, not mine, be done. So he lays out his requests and takes whatever comes from God's hands. That's how we pray. Don't have to be ashamed. You don't have to be slow to put your requests, no matter how big they are, before God. As James tells us, God already knows what we want, so be straight with him. Tell him plainly what you want, but be ready to receive what he wants. And so it's an incredible thing, isn't it? Because Jacob's life has been a mess, and, and his, his days have been full of problems, and his name, Jacob, means deceiver, because that's, you know, that's who he's been, and there's, there's favoritism, and all of these problems, and his heart then is like this, this great big cave, and it's full of dirt and bones and bats and bugs, but then right at the bottom, deep down below the surface, there's this beautifully clear stream of godliness that's refreshing and it's so valuable to see that because we can so easily fall into the trap of thinking that a godly person floats through life without a hair out of place without a care in the world and yet that's not Jacob at all there are times when Jacob has been full of faults favoritism screwed up his family in moments of crisis, he's fallen to pieces. He's been terrified of losing Joseph and then Benjamin. And yet there are times when Jacob, who's been full of faults, is full of faith. And we see there really is a work of God going on in his heart. See, being a godly person doesn't mean getting it right all the time. It doesn't mean that you're free from vices or free from sin and its influences. It doesn't mean that you don't say things that cause incredible damage and hurt those who you love most. A man of God is not a perfect man, but a person who deep down knows the grace of God at work in their life. And so I'd say to you today, take courage if you're a Christian who's made a lot of mistakes. And be generous towards one another. 
I say, take courage if you're a Christian who's made lots of mistakes, because that's no disqualification from godliness. It doesn't mean God can't still work in you. It doesn't mean that you're not capable of doing things and achieving great things for his kingdom as he helps you. So we say, take courage if you're a Christian who's made mistakes, but also be generous towards one another, because it's so easy for us to judge each other based on our worst moments. And yet if we did that with Jacob, we'd have written him off a long time ago. So be generous to each other. God's word says love believes all things. And so don't judge each other by your worst, but by your best moments. And quickly look past each other's flaws and faults. But make much of the graces and the virtues that God is working in your lives. When you meet together and we talk to one another and sometimes talk about each other, don't dwell on the the hurt that's being caused or the character flaws and the weaknesses, but make much of what God has been doing with sinners like us, that there should be anything good in us whatsoever. Let's draw attention to those things because they draw attention to the working of Jesus in our lives. Verse 15 to 17, the boys return to Egypt. And they're received there very well. They're even invited to dinner at the governor's house. But, verse 18, they're afraid. They're scared. They think it's a trap. The governor wants our donkeys. (laughs) Any reasonable person says that's preposterous. Oh, what's wrong with you? This is the second most important man in Egypt. He's got all the donkeys he wants. So what's stopping these boys seeing clearly? Well, the answer continues from last time. These boys are still on the road to repentance, and they're still wrestling with their guilty consciences. God's word said a guilty man runs when nobody's pursuing. Nobody's after these boys, but they're afraid. The only thing chasing these young men is the Holy Spirit hounding their hearts. But for them, Egypt has been this place of painful memories. You can imagine this second time coming in, walking under the archways of of whatever city they're in. We imagine it must be the capital. They just would have all come flooding back. What happened to them the last time they were there? The last time they came, they felt God was on their case and applying pressure. And they'd become convinced that a reckoning was coming from heaven for Joseph's blood. And all of this now is back in their minds. And so they try fixing it themselves. They try putting this to bed with their own power. Verse 19 to 23, they go to the doorkeeper of Joseph's house. We found the money in our bags, but don't worry, we bought extra money with us. So if there was any money that could have been lost by the money that we didn't pay last time through interest or whatever, here it is. We've got more money this time and we bought gifts with us. And then the answer, verse 23, is utterly amazing. It reveals five things. Number one, the boys received the Hebrew greeting, Shalom. Comes from the mouth of an Egyptian doorkeeper. Peace to you. And so we know straight away that Joseph has had a tremendous impact in his household. His money and his status that has just been dumped on him, it has not gone to his head, it's not derailed his determination to live for God, but it has continued to grow and overflowed into the transformation of Egyptians who live in his home, in that they're even using the language of God's people. Peace to you. Then God's name is used. The second thing that's revealing, God's name is used. So the point is further underlined. Joseph's staff know God. What's more, they know God well because the doorman doesn't just say God generally, but your God. I'm going to read it again because I want to see it myself. Verse 23, there we go. Peace to you. Do not be afraid. Your God and the God of your father... And so there's this understanding, you know, a depth of knowledge of who God is, not a general deity, but this is the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all his children. What were the boys thinking when they heard this language coming from an Egyptian? Then the fourth revealing thing, the doorman shows his belief in God's providence. There's no need to pay. I've received your money. Your God must have been good to you. God has provided for you. And then the fifth thing, the proof that there is no debt is that Simeon is free. And he's reunited with his brothers. 
And we know then that this is the, the ceiling of it all because if there was anything left owing, Simeon would still be in jail, but he's back because their debt does not exist. All that's left to do in verse 24 and 25 is get ready for lunch. Now we mustn't allegorize the Old Testament. We've said this again and again as we've gone through Joseph's life. But when we get a clear picture of the gospel, we don't want to ignore it. When Jesus leaps off the page, we want to grab hold of him with both arms and not miss what he's saying to us. And that happens as these boys provide a mirror to our own hearts. They had guilty consciences. And it made them afraid, even though they had no reason to be. And so many people are afraid to deal with God, though they have no reason to be. And they're afraid to come to church. And they're afraid to read their Bibles. And they're afraid to accept that there is a God to whom they owe everything. You remember how Peter reacted when he met the Lord Jesus? Away from me, Lord, for I'm a man of unclean hands, unclean lips. He was afraid. And yet he had no need to be because Jesus' only plan for him was for his good and his only plan for you is for your good. These boys were afraid in Joseph's house and yet the only thing he had for them was joy. And whoever's listening today, whether you're here or you're watching online, don't be afraid to deal with God. He longs to do you good. Then out of that fear, these boys try paying their own way. They try freeing themselves of any obligation that they own by giving their money. They even bought extra money just in case. But the doorman says, peace. Stop it. <laughs> Calm down. Relax. It's done. There's nothing to pay. The Lord Jesus once told a story about a boy who turned his back on his family and took his inheritance from his dad early and squandered his father's hard-earned money living for himself. He spent everything he had until he came to such a low point that the food that pigs were eating seemed appetizing. And when he got there, he decided he would go back to his dad's house. And in preparation, he got ready this long and elaborate speech. He was going to say, Dad, I'm not worthy to be called your son anymore, but instead just let me work for you. Let me be a servant. I'll, I'll sleep with the servants. I'll, I'll live with them, and, and I'll keep the house clean, and I'll earn my right to belong in your house. And then when he met his dad, he began his speech, and his father wouldn't even let him finish it before wrapping him up in his arms and saying, there's nothing for you to pay. You're my boy, and you're home. And so when we feel our guilt over our sin and we're tempted to approach Jesus with all of our promises and our good intentions to make ourselves good enough for him and make up for our failure. And we tell him, look, I don't deserve to be saved by you, but I'll do anything to escape from hell. I'll, be any, I'll do anything to free myself of the guilt of, of my sin. I'll take the worst spot in heaven. Just let me into your house. Jesus wraps us up in his arms. And he says, peace. You owe nothing. And he points to the nail marks in his hands and feet. He says, it's all paid. The debt is paid. The proof that everything was right between the brothers and the prince was that Simeon was released. Their brother was back. They could point to this hard evidence that the accounts were settled. What's the proof that everything is right between God and those who believe on the Lord Jesus? It's not an empty prison, but an empty tomb. We're united now with a risen Lord Jesus, death and hell couldn't hold him. And that's the hard evidence that we point to to say, and so death and hell can't hold me because everything that is owed has been paid by my matchless Savior. Let's pray. Father, we're so grateful to you for the way you've preserved the life of Joseph for us in your word. We thank you for its richness. We thank you for its warmth, its humanity, how real it is. 
but we thank you so much more that we're not just getting a dramatic story, but we're meeting our Savior, Jesus Christ, in, in each one of these chapters. And we pray that as we continue, that that would continue to be true, that the eyes of our hearts would be open to see Jesus on every page. We thank you for valuable lessons about interacting with our parents in a God-honoring way. We thank you for teaching us about the, the nature of godliness and how we can have lives that, that aren't great and still be marked by your goodness to us and still be aware of your sanctifying power changing us and making us godly. We thank you most of all that you've shown us the Lord Jesus again and his beauty, his majesty, his worthiness. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for your goodness in paying our debt so that nothing is owed. Oh, I pray that you'd help us to know you better and glorify you more in your name. Amen. Amen.